Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, lovely to, to be here tonight. Um, so this is really a defining strategy for us as an organisation. It's, it's our signalling of intent of where we're going to work and the journey that we're asking all of our partners to come on with us. So what we're presenting in this plan is essentially our, our vision. And when I say the word partners, I just want to expand on what we mean by that. We mean our partners in local authorities, different national bodies, the government, specialist institutions, and most importantly, partners in terms of communities and the people who live, work and visit the national park. So our plan sets out this longer term vision for 2045, but it focuses down on what the most important things are for us to undertake in the next five years in order to create the momentum needed towards achieving our vision. If you'll indulge me just a little bit, uh, when I presented the plan um, at our last board session, I kindly borrowed a quote from the organization Civic who are based in Birmingham who really work at the coalface of a lot of the themes that we have within our plan. And they said that we live in a time where multiple globalized systems are entangled in ways that have cascading impacts on society and the natural world that we rely on. And this global poly crises that we're witnessing, which is the simultaneous uh, occurrence of several catastrophic events, affects every aspect of our lives and is experienced most viscerally as multiple impacts begin to converge on the places that we live, play, eat, rest, visit and grow within. And as we uh, look at Collins Dictionary's word of the year in 2022, which was permacrisis, it means that we're in an extended period of insecurity and instability. So we find ourselves at a pivotal moment. Time is running out to tackle the climate emergency and nature crisis. Our average world temperature is increasing. I don't need to tell you any more of the headlines that you've probably seen in the news and a lot of our plan and the documentation covers a lot of the facts behind these twin crises. At a global level, this means rising temperatures are fueling environmental degradation, natural disasters, weather extremes, food and water insecurity, economic disruption and wider conflict. But these global crises can also be felt at the most hyperlocal of scales, and we feel it in our own national park. And I don't want to take over Simon's uh, place tonight to tell you uh, some of what's in uh, the plan, and you'll be able to read this in your own time. But we cover what some of these challenges are that we are facing. So we think that national parks can really lead the way by taking action on the ground to show you how we can all play a part, part or play a part, a part in tackling these crises. And you'll see this aspiration in our plan. The contents of some of it are quite vast and it's quite expansive on what we're seeking to achieve. In some places, it's really open actually to how we'll achieve some of those objectives as we need to be flexible to a changing environment. So our plan is cognizant that the scale of the challenges we face and the solutions that we develop are all interrelated in some way. Thus our plan and our work is really at a systems level. So this covers things like being not just a net zero organization, but looking at net zero across the national park green economy and green jobs to how we tackle better transport and make sure that that is sustainable, how we help community businesses thrive with increasing visitor numbers and make sure that we look after, protect and restore nature. And if you take one of those, you'll find that it connects with the other. So our work at the National Park cannot be reductionist and our plan seeks uh, to counter that. So we must find ways to tackle both these crises and meet the needs of local residents, communities and the huge amount of visitors who come here every year and that is a tricky balance to strike. What we're dealing with for 21st century challenges and our partnership plan must afford us that flexibility to address the challenges that we've outlined in an agile and responsive way. And just to borrow from Civic again um, from their writing, uh, a quote from them is that their 20th, the 20th century models, methods and institutions will not work for the scale and breadth of these new 21st century challenges. What I hope when you hear about the plan and you see it, uh, you'll find that what's being presented is bold and ambitious. But underlying this is a confidence and a knowledge and data from our experienced offers and rain rangers. Um, and a lot of the conversations I know Simon will touch upon that we've had with different partners over the years and continued commitment to work with residents and local communities. Yeah. So at this hyper-local hyper level, our plan is really based on the acute pressures that we understand that maybe some of you on this call are facing uh, the state of nature in the National Park um, and how we really work, make visit visitors, residents, local communities and nature work together in harmony. 
So this plan signals where we want to go and who we need to go with. So in the words of the plan, if we can't do this alone, we're asking you, if not here, where, if not now, when, and if not us, who. We all, I think, have a chance to make a real difference if we can act and figure out how to make this work all together. Um, and I think our partnership plan is a really good rising call to action. So I'm going to pass over to Simon now to take you through a bit more about how we're running this consultation, a bit more about what's in the plan and how to get involved. And can I just remind people, please put questions into the chat. I've already seen one there, which is great. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. And over to you, Simon. Great, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. Um, Simon Jones, I'm Director of Environment and Visitor Services for the National Park Authority. Really appreciate you taking your time tonight uh, to uh, uh, hear a bit more about what the, the, the National Park Partnership Plan cur currently is. As, as Chris said, as Sarah said, this is really in some ways a warm up act to encourage you all to uh, play a role in joining the consultation. Uh, finding a way to sort of make your comments, leave your questions, really have a, have a view on that. Emma, who's going to follow me, will uh, talk you through kind of the mechanics of how that, that works. So what I'm going to do really is touch on, I suppose, how the, the content of the plan really works, how it's structured, but without going into too much technical detail, because you can find that all uh, in way, uh, way you know, better and finer grain of detail than we can cover off tonight when you go and look at it yourself in a really accessible kind of uh, way of doing that online. So if we could just move on to the next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to kind of clarify what, what a partnership plan is exactly. Um, in terms of the, the, the title, it, it is not a, a plan just for the National Park Authority. It is a plan, a strategic level plan for the, for the park itself, all across the park. It is the name specifically is uh, in terms of using the word partnership is designed to imply that it can only be delivered in partnership. So the National Park Authority, we have a statutory rule as we're uh, both currently uh, national parks in Scotland have to do with to prepare a five year strategic plan for all of the park. Um, but how we how we deliver this and how we co-create it as well is really uh, done across a whole bunch a bunch of partners, stakeholders uh, at all levels, really from, from grassroots right way up to sort of uh, Scottish government. So that's what the plan is about. It's we have a five year sort of cycle that we operate these plans on. But what's different with this plan to follow, uh, particularly what Sarah has talked about in the relation to the trying to tackle the nature and climate crises, uh, we're looking beyond that. We're looking not only to 2029, we're looking to 2030, we're looking to 2040. So think of it as a plan that really looks over for the next couple of decades, uh, really, and how it tries to really set the scene of what needs to happen, what needs to change, and what we need to see uh, happening on the ground in the National Park. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So it, it's no, no surprise that in terms of at a strategic level, uh, we've, we've put a lot of thought and we've listened to a, a lot of partners, a lot of local communities, businesses, visitors, kind of views on, on what we're trying to achieve here is where is the place that we want to go? What is the what is the vision for this park in 2030 and in, in 2045? So on the next slide, we, we lay that out in a quite a short sentence, which we hope kind of resonates with everybody. You get an idea of what we're what we really want to focus our priorities on. And it tries to capture the importance of the climate and the nature crises that we're fa facing at a, at a global, national, international, local level that, that, that Sarah talked about, but really where people are at completely at the heart of that and the journey that we all need to go on together to deliver really a more sustainable future for, for us all. And the role of this park and the people who live, work and visit here, what the role they have, they have in that. And it's that's a climate resilient place where people and nature thrive together and we would say that's not quite the place that we're in now actually so if you go into some of the background and the context scene in the earlier parts of the the consultation when you look at it it'll, it'll set the scene out as as we and many others see it now is there's a lot of room for improvement here about how how we can make this a, a truly better place for future generations etc so if we move on please so just to follow up there and re-emphasize that point about the National Park Authority's role as being responsible for the uh, 
pulling together the plan, the drafting, the consultation, as you've heard. So the, the current draft is something that is already an assimilation of many, many views uh, far and wide, distilled into one place, but put out there as something that is what we're calling a conversation. That will then be reviewed following the consultation, refined until it's in its final draft form to go towards to our board and then eventually to be to be signed off by Scottish ministers when they when they're comfortable with it. So there's still a few months in this process uh, to go and the consultation is absolutely key in that. But collaboration and delivery is all completely about working with uh, with people to, to make sure that happens. Next slide, please. I think to, to follow the scene set that you've already heard is I think something that is maybe quite radically different in its thinking with this, this partnership plan is how honest we think we all need to be about the need for transformational long-term change and how the evidence of climate change, the evidence of the biodiversity crisis, the, the shockwave still we feel are from post-pandemic and how a rural economy has to deal with, deal with that in, in, a, in a very changing world is we think mean, means that things really need to change quite significantly in, in some areas and some places. So that forms the kind of background and they, they become the main themes of the plan. And what I'm going to take you through now is I want to touch on the, the three themes that sit, sit within the plan. So we're going to go through those uh, one at a time and then we'll, I want to finish off in my final slide just a little bit about how you'll then find more details about these things if you go and explore the, the consultation online. So uh, if we move on a couple of slides, so sorry, first one is to, so restoring nature, uh, tackling the global, regional, local climate, uh, sorry, biodiversity crisis is, is absolutely key and is the, the kind of first main theme within a, an our plan. So what does that mean? Uh, so if we can move on to the next slide, please. So under restoring nature, we, we see three main kind of delivery areas that are required here. And you'll see them there, restoring nature for climate, restoring nature for health ecosystems and shaping a new planned economy. So just to give you a little bit of detail about what that we, we we're seeing those actually mean. What we do know is that the natural assets, the natural heritage of the park, particularly our peatland soils and our forests are incredibly important for storing and capturing carbon. So basically, uh, healthy forest, forest ecosystems, healthy peatland ecosystems, and to a degree our water environment, if they're in a healthy um, condition, if we repair and allow them to recover and regenerate from their, their current state, we're effectively locking in carbon and starting to sequester carbon, to capture carbon from the atmosphere. So by doing that, we are actively contributing towards tackling climate change. And our natural environment is really important and the park is, 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 has a rich uh, amount of abundance here, although some of it is unfavorable condition. So we really want to focus on how we move that unfavorable condition into a better condition in terms of restoring our trees and our, our forest cover, uh, restoring our, our peatlands and our, and our water environment as well. Restoring nature for healthy, healthy ecosystems, I suppose in some ways is what you call maybe a, a rich of sort of wildlife for wildlife's sake, but it's allowing it to recover from quite a lot of uh, land management practices that in parts and in the places in, in, in time in the past have eroded the real equality, the, the integrity, how disconnected that some of those habitats have become and how we repair and connect and expand those ecosystems, allow them to become really healthy ecosystems to deliver for us the clean water, the air, the timber, the soil that we need to, that really underpins a lot of the, the land use in, in the park. And the final one is that what we are entitled to kind of shaping a new land economy, and that's really about how we currently use our land. And currently the land in the park is, is, is really about production. It's about production of food, largely in the, in the place of meat in terms of life, livestock, but also through wild deer or, or timber and through, through I think it's things associated with woodland products as well. And it's a kind of about going beyond just production and it's about the value of more really sustainable and regenerative land use practices and farming that deliver more for, for nature and climate as, as, as well as for people and the, and the skills and the jobs that are, that are found with that really important economy and sector within the park.
So that's, they're, they're the areas of, um, within the restoring nature theme. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll come to the second uh, main theme in the, in the draft plan, which is creating a, su a sustainable low carbon destination. As you can see, the, the real connection there is largely around about the kind of climate, but also uh, the way that we use our national park, the way that we build and live in our national park and, and enjoy it. So the, the, again, this is split into, uh, on the next slide, into a series of uh, areas, three areas here connecting everyone with nature, which, as Chris already said, has already come through the consultation as people think being really important for, for them personally, but also for others in terms of understanding and engagement and respect of the park and protecting it for future generations. The second one is about improving popular, uh, popular places and, and routes, like the real busy hotspots, I suppose, within the park. And the third one is about travel, about low carbon travel and the direction that we want to go in about this. So the first one, I think more specifically, other than saying, well, how, how do you connect everyone with nature? I think there's, there's a couple of things that we want to focus on is one, when we say everyone, we really want to see everyone. We want to see a greater level of diversity. Currently there are groups, parts of society that aren't able to get to the park easily, culturally, maybe, maybe not uh, uh, historically been in, involved in visiting the park and we want to really see everyone uh, who can it's everyone's national park uh, how they can sustainably enjoy enjoy the place that i'll come back to that later because it's also connected with how people get here and move around here as well to to truly make it more more sustainable it's also about how we i think in terms of uh, local business in terms of tourism how we become sustainable so the messages around our for, for our visitors and our local businesses how we really start to build in the idea of being more sustainable with how we all personally act and how we enjoy this whether we live here whether we work here whether we visit here how we think start to think really about climate and nature a lot more in in in, in our in our business sector our land use sector and our tourism sector within the park the second one about improving popular places and routes for those of you that might know a little bit about the way that the, the park and our projects over the past couple of years, uh, we, we very much uh, fo uh, focus on the notion of place and, and, and we have a place project and a place uh, program, a place team. And that's really investment in the, these most popular places. So the real visit the hotspots particularly, but also uh, where they're core with where people who are resident here sit side by side with, with many, many visitors around Block Lomond particularly and parts of the Trossics, particularly these are really our visitor, visit hotspots and our visitor management and how we continue to invest in the infrastructure in these places. But bearing in mind, we want to be um, aware of the, the implications of climate and nature, particularly by people enjoying these places. So what is the footprint, the carbon footprint, the footprint on nature of investing in, in places, again, to make them more sustainable, more robust, high quality, they bring real benefit to the visitors and, and local people as well. And the final area within, within the second theme is about low carbon travel for everyone. And it's, it's maybe a no great surprise, and again, it's been, been flagged by Chris, that we know that we're dominated by uh, largely a uh, fossil fuel uh, filled uh, private vehicle, private car uh, world that many people who come to the park do so in, in, pri in private cars. They travel around in, in the cars in many ways because there are very few alternatives. And, and likewise, if you live here in many places, if you haven't got a car, you're going to really struggle to get around. We want the place in the future where better more sustainable public transport is, is a real, real option for people who live here, work here and visit here. And also, as well as that, active travel op options, you know, whether cycling, walking, wheeling, whatever. So you can, there are different ways of getting around the park that leave a smaller environmental footprint and lead to less congestion that we have in some real key areas in the park, particularly uh, East, East Loch Lomond is, is a good example of that. So, they're the three areas within the, uh, the second theme of a sustainable low carbon destination. And I'll move on to the final uh, theme that sits within, within the plan. You will see some crossover here between the areas and the theme. So uh, hopefully when you do uh, go into the consultation, you'll see that there's kind of connections as you read things, you'll think, 
oh yeah, well, that looks like it has a crossover with an earlier, there's something earlier I read. And that's deliberate because there's, there is real interconnectivity with things that deliver for nature, for, for, for climate and, and for people and, you know, and, and economy as well, really, and related to housing even. So they, they'll themes that you'll see throughout. So if we move on to the, the next slide, there, again, there are three main areas within this greener economy and sustainable living one, which again, you, you've already heard me talk a little bit about or already about the, the, the overarching uh, uh, aim and vision of the plan. But within these, these three, three areas within this specifically, we're talking about how we transition over time. And this word appears throughout the document and it, it's really important for us because we cannot have a hard stop of, uh, you know, fossil fuel vehicles um, in relation to land, land use as it currently is. We can't just say, right, that's all going to stop overnight. We're going to have something new, you know, in one or two years time. It's going to take us as a society a period of time to transition and slowly shift to a more sustainable uh, way of living in terms of land use and in transport. And there have to be reasonable uh, alternatives in place to allow us to do that transition and people have to make a living have to still be able to get to work travel around do what we do what they do etc um, in in that period that still offers a chance to you know have a have a living in the park visit in the in the park as well so it, it's going to take us time to move that so this idea of a transitioning towards a, a greener economy where we have our businesses and our places are more focused on their impacts in climate and, and nature and how that's a really part of the packaging of the USP of the park and the businesses here that are really climate and nature friendly and also that the land use in time gets to a, a place where it's really regenerative, regenerative and sustainable as well and that good quality green jobs and skills and opportunities come, come with that transition as well. The second area is about living well locally, and this is really about good quality health and well-being. In some ways, many, many of the things that national parks have been doing for, for decades and decades now, but it's making sure that people, um, as well as value it, really get something from it, from their physical, mental well-being, because they're either living or working or visiting here with, with very active lifestyles and that there's infrastructure in place to allow them uh, to do that. As well as that, the, the local idea of how the goods and services that you have that hopefully you get as many of them at a local level as you can in terms of production as well, in food and services etc to reduce the travel footprint that, that whether you be a resident or a visitor you have to do so you try and use locally you have an active healthy lifestyle which is in everybody's in everybody's interest and the final one is about development and infrastructure investment and then development here we mean, we mean like kind of a planning and uh, rural development how, housing and uh, built environment sector. And it's how we think about a, a greener, more sustainable um, future within our uh, kind of planning and, uh, structure. So we are a statutory planning authority and we have to, every uh, few years, have to produce what's called a local development plan, which really provides the guidance to how development and planning uh, works within the, the national park and what we really want to do is how to make sure that we really integrate climate and nature thinking and practices into our new local development plan which will be starting soon so we really understand the, in, the true impact of development but we look to use best practice and we know we, we look to say how can you get uh, gain for nature as a result of, of development as well so we we think about surrounding landscape as well as the building or sets of buildings that we might be working on. So apologies, that was a real quick run through of, of something that, as I say, you'll find a much, uh, much more detail within the consultation. I think in terms of just one more slide, so uh, I can move on to the next slide, just to say what you'll see is when you look at each chapter, and when you say chapter, that's the, the three themes that I've just been through of restoring nature, uh, uh, connect the uh, connecting with everybody and the greener uh, greener economy the sustainable living one you'll see there's these six sort of common common points that will appear in each one so they'll they'll explain what does it mean what's the current situation so what is it what is it like now in terms of nature climate 
housing development, etc. And what could it be like? We have set ourselves longer term aims that we want to achieve by 2045, but then shorter term objectives, things that we want to move to and be able to measure by 2030, which is not that far away at all. The policies and how we want to, you know, what we need in terms of partnership, who can help us deliver that to meet those aims by uh, 2045 long term, and then how we might uh, monitor that and measure that in terms of proposed measures of success or how many, how much of our peatlands we want to restore, uh, 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 expansion of our forests, etc. What that might look like in in, in time and our, our investment and connection, how we're going to engage with people in terms of living well well locally as well. So they'll be uh, common throughout all the all the chapters that you read. And um, Emma now is going to take you through how you're going to how you're going to be able to use the consultation to navigate through to uh, from uh, explain further about what, what I said. Over to you, Emma. Thanks. Thanks again, Simon. Just to chip in, there's some great questions coming in. Please keep them coming in on the um, the question and answer. As I said, if we don't get to them tonight, we will certainly get to them later on. So thanks very much. Over to you, Emma. Thanks, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you might see a different name up for me at the moment as Jay Cook, but I'm not. I, uh, my name is Emma. I'm one of the communications managers at the National Park, and I've been um, helping to support this project and look at ways that we can open things up for you to be able to get involved in the development of this plan. So you've heard a little bit more from uh, Sarah about kind of why we've developed this, what the big challenges are that are facing the National Park. You've then heard from Simon about what a partnership plan is and what's really driving the content of the proposed content of, of our next partnership plan. So I'm just going to talk you through a little bit of how you can help to shape it. The draft document that uh, we published in April, it's now open for consultation. Um, but this is so much more than just a, a consultation on a draft strategic plan. This is an opportunity for us to really open up our conversations and talk to you people with an interest about the National Park about what could the national park be in 5, 15, 20 years? And what should it be as Scotland's national park? Um, and there's three things that we really want to kind of get out of this conversation process. One of which being opportunities like this so that we can raise awareness of some of the really big things that are, are facing the national park. You may come to enjoy uh, Duck Bay on a sunny Saturday, but did you know that nature is uh, in trouble here as it is across the world? Uh, do you know how much the climate emergency is impacting some of our communities? So this kind of process is just an opportunity for us to be able to talk a little bit about some of the big things happening and for you to be able to learn more about these challenges as well. But that also means that that gives us an opportunity to learn from yourselves as well. You've already heard that this draft plan has been uh, developed based on conversations with lots of different people, um, a, a big evidence base and lots of other kind of strategic plans that fed into this. But we really want to use these next few weeks as an opportunity to kind of learn from and with yourselves um, because you will all have experiences and stories in the National Park that we can use to help inform how we develop and finalize this plan. And then uh, the last thing that we want to kind of get out of this process is talking about, you know, how do we make it happen? We've talked about what the challenges are. We've proposed what we think the big things are that we should be focusing on. And when I say we, I mean everyone who has a role to play in looking after the National Park. So that's the National Park Authority, other public agencies, communities that live here, visitors that come to enjoy this place, people who own and manage the land. Everyone has that role to play. So we want to talk about how do we actually make these big changes happen? Are there any barriers that we need to overcome in order to do that? Um, and also just hear a little bit more about what you might already have been doing and how we can significantly upscale our work over the coming years to be able to meet these big challenges. So the main way that you can kind of get involved in this uh, conversation phase is online. And to do that, we've developed a engagement platform using Commonplace. Uh, it's a system you might have heard of. I know other local authorities use it. Lots of uh, other organisations use it as a place where you can have a, a digital conversation about various different projects. So we've included a URL there for you to be able to access Commonplace. You don't need to memorise it or write it down just now. We'll be able to send that out with uh, uh, comms following this event so that you can access it. But Commonplace is uh, where you can go to learn more about the plan and take part in this conversation.
So one of the aspects that you can use Commonplace for is reading the plan. Now, the draft plan in full, it's well over 100 pages. We're not expecting everyone to read it, although if you do, well done, that's fantastic. Um, however, Commonplace provides summaries based on the three key themes that uh, Simon has already set out for you today. So you can go into those three chapters and just kind of see the summary points, the really key points about those themes and feedback your initial thoughts and what you think about, about uh, those. We then set up three different ways that you can kind of get involved in the conversation further. Now, one way of doing this is answering our quick survey. This is the one that's really uh, been created for people who live and work or, or visit the national park who want to tell us about their experiences. So it's a only five, 10 minute survey, and it's really based on kind of quick questions about what you want to see in the national park and an opportunity for you to tell us more about uh, places you visit, places you live, and the changes that you want to see. The second option then is to complete our full survey. Now our full survey gives you the opportunity to be able to work through each of the aims and outcomes, the policies and partnerships we think we need to be able to make all the changes that we've set out in the draft plan happen. And this is your opportunity to tell us how you could work with us to be able to deliver some of this. What role can you really play to be able to upscale peatlands? Or what role would you be able to play to help us to connect everyone with nature? And then the third way of uh, feeding in on commonplace is using our interactive map. Now, this is the place that if you've got specific stories or if you've got changes that you want to see in specific locations, you can drop a pin on the map and tell us about that specific place. That means that you can tell us about kind of places that you like to visit. That means you can tell us about areas that you think actually we need more housing in this community. Or if you've been struggling to get a bus from I don't know, Korean Larrick to somewhere else, you can tell us this is where we really think we need to focus public transport efforts. So those are the three crucial ways that you can get involved online. Also on Commonplace, there's a latest news function. So in this area, we, um, we include updates about the project. We also include updates about uh, things you might not know, things you might find interesting, and also, uh, various events and things that we're holding. So opportunities like this for you to find out more. On Commonplace, you're also able to sign up to receive these news updates direct to your inbox. So you don't need to keep coming back to, to keep an eye on them. So then finally, uh, as I said, we're holding various different events over this next few weeks of the consultation, either coming along to events in the National Park or holding opportunities like this. And here are some of the places where you can find out about uh, about them and how to get involved even more. So keeping an eye on our social media platforms or that's the URL there to visit our Commonplace site directly. So as we said earlier, this is a, a formal consultation period. It's a 12 week consultation period. The draft plan was published on the 26th of April and we've got until the 19th of July before the consultation closes. And this is the really crucial time over this next six, seven weeks um, for you to be able to have your say. That's not to say that there's not opportunities following that. As you can see on the slide um, in September, there will be a kind of interim update to our board about what we've heard over this conversation period. And then we'll be finalizing the draft plan um, ready to go back to our board in December. And then hopefully um, with approval from the board to Scottish ministers in uh, early 2024. So even though this is the main consultation period, this is your main time to be able to get involved in this conversation. Uh, the process will take uh, a little bit longer following that. Okay, and I think that's for me. I'll hand back to you, Jeff. Thanks very much indeed, and thanks very much, everyone there. Um, right, let's now go to the, uh, the the questions, and there's some fantastic questions coming in. Um, and what's really good is there. I, I think we can sort of see that they're bringing some of the key issues. So we've got issues around transport. We've got issues around housing locally. Uh, we certainly got issues about budgets that are there or not there. Um, about definition of sustainable, we use it all the time. It's a very good question. Um, and then a whole series around the evidence base, because quite clearly what we need to have is an evidence base. Um, and we need the information from lots of different partners to do it. 
So I'm, I'm not saying that any one of these is more important than others, but certainly we've got a whole series around um, transport. So maybe we can start off um, asking Susan and Simon if you can tackle some of the, the transport ones. And the key points I think are really that we haven't actually got opportunities. There isn't good public transport here. So what can we be doing about it? How can we plan for it? Particularly on the, the east side, but not only. Um, ideas of electric minibuses, idea of car parks and shuttle buses. I know we've had some thoughts and we've been doing work on these. So maybe we can start with the questions around transport, sustainable transport, and how could we address these issues which uh, a lot of people have raised. Okay, over to you. Simon, you're going to come out. Yeah, hi, yeah, I'm. I'm happy to to kick off, and then other, other members of the panel want to come in. Yes, yeah, so I was just having a look at the questions. Yeah, thank, thanks for those, everybody. And just to tie them up, I, I suppose in in some ways, if we rewind to say that as actually as you know, we we talk about the draft uh, partnership plan, as people have clearly highlighted in the comments and the questions on in the Q and A section. Basically, there was a rural transport system it, it isn't really fit for purpose in terms of public public transport in terms of what what we've currently got so that is a a sort of a society-wide issue uh, it, pretty much in in all of the rural rural U, uk we're not unique in in relation to that and to to shift that to get to a place by 2030 2045 um is is, is a significant you know, issue to tackle and how we do that. And, and I think we've got some practical things that we're doing, but I would say what, sort of fundamentally what we're seeing is this isn't, this isn't working well enough. It's causing several you know, problems in relation to emissions, congestion, it's not sustainable. So let's identify actually, we want it to be better in the future. Over the past couple of years, we've been particularly engaged with our local authority partners about how, in terms of things like rural bus services, et cetera, and to a degree in Balak as well, in terms of uh, trains, et cetera, how, how we raise the profile of the national park so it's not just the bus services aren't just based on uh, resi resident journeys that we base them on, on visitor journeys as well, which currently they're not in terms of the timetabling. So we, over the past few months, we've been working on sort of three, three things in relation, let's call it wider sustainable travel. I'll come to active, back to active, active travel in a little while, is that we launched a journey planner app, which is a sort of public transport app for, for people uh, to work out between how they link uh, bus journeys, train journeys, etc. So you can get a kind of a platform that allows you uh, to uh, find a way if you don't have a have your own car or whatever to, to get to the park now what's clear in that is that that's not straightforward and there's big gaps in that and there's big big delays but the app's been quite successful i've had over 10 10 000 people sign up to that so we kind of trialed that as a how do you get it to work in in in, in people's head about what is become something an um, integrated service that's fit for purpose the second thing in some ways is understanding the nature of the problem and considering what the options might be more and we've uh, we're working with the con consultants to produce a sustainable travel options appraisal and what's been called a, a modal shift report modal shift being actually you know how do we get to a totally different way of transport so that in the future well, there is the transport around the park it has a lower a much lower kind of climate related footprint in terms of numbers it's a genuine option to get into the park and around the park using modes of public transport, whether that be uh, bus, whether it could be active travel as well, obviously cycle as well, uh, you know, train uh, on certainly Loch Lomond up the west side of Loch Lomond and in places, water buses as well, particularly on, on Loch Lomond. So we're at a stage where we're just starting to say what, what, what are the real options here? And that provides us, I suppose, with a, a, a program, a proposal to be able to go to particularly our local authorities and transport authorities and say, look, we think this is doable, but we've got to have a coalition of the willing here. We want the National Park to be a place that tries to do this. We, we as a park authority, we don't hold, have all the answers to this. We have a willing. We know our communities certainly want a much better uh, service, particularly a bus service. And we know many of our visitors, particularly the, the groups of people who can't really get to the park because they don't have a car, they struggle, they struggle to it. So therefore, it's not an option for them to come and visit this park because the transport system doesn't really allow them to do that. So I suppose what we're at the minute we're focused on is really understanding how we 
we go with a pitch and say, right, there's a better way here. This is what it could start to look like. An example of that is there's been there's a couple of I know, points, well-made points about uh, shuttle bus, trial bus, electric buses, is uh, last year we did try to pilot shuttle bus service through the, through the Trossachs, uh, and we successfully bought in additional funding from that by a sort of SUSTRANS on it. But unfortunately, we didn't get any takers from any of the local uh, bus, bus companies. Uh, there was a huge bus driver shortage. So it didn't, it didn't work for, for us last year, even though we tried, tried to run it. And we learned a lot in the process. We are currently just looking at a final set of responses to try and run it again this summer. Um, and we, we're kind of exploring all avenues to see whether we can do this. But at the minute, I would say I, the, the kind of key issue that we have is, is the way the currently kind of rural bus companies are set up and how they work and how they are going to deliver something that either, uh, you know, we'd rather go to a local business and, and work with them to deliver that with the local transport authority and the local authority. But uh, in some ways, that's proven a real, a real challenge. So, so not easy. Final thing, sorry. Simon, can I, can I just uh, uh, jump in, just see if Susan wants to add to that, but maybe also um, people who are typing in and writing in, it would be really good to get your ideas of where you've seen successes. I know we've talked to some of the other national parks and many of you will have seen the queues and the traffic jams in um, I was going to say Snowdonia because I, I can't remember its current Welsh name. I do apparently. I apologise. I think it's Ethry, um, and in the Lake District. Um, so we're very keen to get um, success ideas from you. More evidence as to the key issues. And I see there's um, worries there about road services and paths. Um, so I think that's really important that we get that from that angle. Susan, anything to add? If not, I'll move on to housing. Just one small point, um, Chris. I just I see Margaret McDonald's noted in the comments about connections on the east side of the park. There is loads of information we've noticed in communities on action plans and local place plans. So we have um we have looked at all of these and you know we, we believe we're aware we're aware of what's coming through from the local place plans but please do respond to the consultation with, with anything else or any other issues so that we've got that look that intelligence from local communities as well as what we're hearing to meet visitor needs as well because we ideally we want solutions that, that meet everybody's needs and can work work creatively towards that thanks chris Thanks very much. And thanks, Jim, for the comments. Uh, the Cairngorms National Park, we, we, as I said, we're certainly learning from a number of places there. So transport, really big one. And it's, it'll be good to get your comments because I think there is always this clash between transport for visitors and transport for the community because it's vital that the community can still work and move and get to work. And every weekend they're not sort of um, pinned in by the, the, the tourists. Um, there's a, a just before we leave transport, there was a question right at the beginning about moving from fossil fuel boats and jet skis to sustainable and inoffensive water transport. And I know that we as a park have uh, bought a, an electric motor, but maybe Simon, you can talk about other ideas. And again, if this is what you want to see in a plan and you want to see that big vision, that's brilliant. That's the sort of comments we want. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, good good question and one that we've been uh, grappling with ourselves you know we've got a small kind of uh, what's called a marine fleet but a, a bunch of boats on Loch Lomond that our, our ranger service used and uh, we have we do have one electric boat uh, it's a kind of a, uh, a maintenance so it's a fairly fairly slow boat they I think we have tried to lead the way in the where we can in the provision of uh, if we're going to buy a new craft we try and get something that's electric hybrid hybrid in terms of boats it, in the UK market, it doesn't really exist at the minute, but but I think the more that people ask and more they accept, and as fossil fuel engines are phased out, that the boat market, the marine market, will start to start to shift. Um, so we, our latest patrol boat, we deliberately installed outboard motors on it with a view that it, when they're when they're available, they're either electric or even possibly hydrogen powered, which is one option for. For, for, for fresh water for marine fleets is becomes a genuine option in the future when it's when when it's available the technology is not quite there yet it lags well behind what 
uh, land-based vehicles can do. But that being said, I think that's a direction travel we want to, we want to be in. Like, exactly the same as we've done our, with our land-based vehicle fleet. As it becomes an option, we do it and we'd want to encourage others users on, on, on the lock uh, to, to encourage that, that, uh, that technology as well. And I think there'll be ways that we can help nudge and support people to do that, that over time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. And I think the key thing there is we're going to do it ourselves, but we need to have an, a partnership approach. And, and again, if you've got ideas of where that's going to be most impactful, that would be really important. Um, maybe I can use that, that word impactful just to come on to some really good questions that come in from Jeff Riddington, which I'll, I'll summon them up as being the evidence base, because quite clearly uh, we need evidence of um, all sorts of things that we're going to move forward, whether it's the impact of climate change, whether it's the impact or the, the loss of biodiversity, whether it's the, the numbers of visitors that we've got. So, Simon, it might be quite useful just to have a little bit about the evidence base. And again, if people have got good data from elsewhere, um, absolutely send it in. There are lots of sources of data. Um, and they are very important that we get as many as we can so that we can actually look at these from different angles. Um, but maybe, I mean, just a, as an example on the, the, the inter, interlocking of a lot of this information. So we know, for instance, on the climate change side that we're getting a lot warmer um, water in the lock and in some of the streams. And we know that's causing problems to salmon. And we know also that it's causing increases in blue-green algae Lugin algae are a real problem for tourists, for people actually accessing the lock, and that can have a knock on on the economy. Um, and there are good examples of that happening elsewhere in Loch Leven, for instance, in previous years. So we know and we can see what's happening, but actually providing that evidence in the plan and collecting evidence from other people, I think is going to be key. So Simon, Susan, do you want to say something about that and the evidence base? Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in, that's okay. Um, so throughout the plan, we've referenced um, various um, studies or documents. We've drawn on quite a lot of national research, um, drawn on national trends and issues, but we've also used um, park specific research as well. Chris has mentioned climate, but we've also commissioned some specific research on topics such as housing, and we've been doing work on transport as well. So. They are all referenced throughout the plan itself and there, there's some links as well on our website if anyone does want to have a closer look and read at some of the various background bits and pieces. There are some topics within the plan that are quite new and that, that we don't have all answers on um, at the moment. So we talked earlier um, about green jobs um, and skills. We believe that there potentially is quite a lot of opportunity within the park um, as we transition towards a greener economy that we could see more job creation and we're really keen to find out what sort of jobs these will be and um, who will be taking up these jobs and to make sure that that they can come and work in the park that we they can have transport and housing options as well so there's still quite a bit of work to be done in some of these newer areas um, and that, that will be the purpose of the plan over the, the coming years um, to flesh out our evidence base even more um, as, as we tease out some of these issues. But certainly throughout the plan, you, you'll see links um, to various um, documents and research that, that's, that's available if you, if you wish to delve into more detail. Great stuff. Um, I'm watching the clock and also trying to pick up things here. The blue green algae one on farmland. Yes, we're certainly talking with SEPA in particular um, about runoff um, and uh, the challenges that that's there. Now, I, I'm going to turn to a, a really important question that's come in from Jeff Riddington about sustainability. We all use the word. I'm as guilty as everyone else. Um, and, and a lot of things are sustainable in one person's eyes and not in another, and particularly when it comes down to, to money and subsidies, whether it's subsidies for farming or subsidies for housing or subsidies for transport. Um, so do we need to be more careful about how we define sustainable, Simon and, and Susan, in all of this? Because I think it's, it's a very good point. And again, I'd really appreciate other people's take on what they see as sustainability, because that's clearly what we're striving for. Yes, thanks. And I was just uh, trying to remind myself, I was skimming through the document as well, because in terms of what their glossary, lots of our terms uh, 
because some of them are by definition are a bit, a bit technical. So we had a glossary, but I can't, I can't find it at the minute. And so whether we've got sustainable in there, I don't, I don't know. That would need a further investigation. Um, I think I think the question here is, is a good one and sustainability as a term uh, is, is used for all different things. I would say we're trying to use it in its truest sense that you know in a, in a kind of un level that it's looking for you know using you know the the use of resources which mean what use resources are or, or, or anything really that is not at the detriment of future generations or the environment effectively so what we want to see is is, is restoration to create you know both a uh, for, for for climate for nature that brings brings with you know with with it benefit for people. So uh, without Googling the, the, the UN uh, Environment Programme definition of it exactly, I would say that I would always hope that what's intended to its use in the, in the current draft plan. But as Chris says, uh, other views, if that needs further clarification, uh, happy to hear that. No, I, but I, I think we also need to remember that, I mean, I, I'm an ecologist, so I think of environmental sustainability and systems that keep working soil for instance vital for farming we need sustainable soils going forward but we also need sustainable communities i mean it's really important in terms of this um you know and, and therefore what sustains a community and it's you know it's it's it it's connectivity and that brings back another question really good how do we get to people particularly in this consultation and maybe this is one for susan who haven't got it connections that are brilliant and you know digital connectivity um um, I, how do we do that? And the, and the other one I, I don't want to lose is, is about housing, but let's let's deal with that one first of all, Susan. Connectivity, how do we get to people? Yeah, I can um, respond to that one, Emma. You might want to, to chip in as well. So um, we're doing a lot digitally, as you're aware, but also I'm very aware that not everybody um, can access information in this manner. So um, there's... A, copies of the documents um, available um, at places throughout the park. Um, they're certainly in all the libraries just now, but we are currently working um, with communities to find out um, what other locations we can make information available, whether that's local hubs. Um, we've got posters going out as well this week um, that are dotted around various places within the park as well, just letting people know and to give people a bit of a flavour of what's within the plan as well. Um, just um, if there's important topics of, or issues, um, that, that will be going out this week as well. So alongside digital, there, there's another um, campaign as well, um, just to make sure that, that, that we reach everybody as well, particularly older people who we know um, don't um, engage as much through these means. Speaking as an older one, thank you, Susan. Um, just one last one before we. I'm watching the clock, and that, and that is housing. Um, a really important point from Mark McDonald there about local housing, and again back to sustainability. How and what do we need to see and hear about housing? And and again, please put your comments in. Yeah, do you want me to say a few words on that, Chris, just before we finish up? That'd be brilliant, Susan. Yep, yeah, brilliant. yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Housing is a key issue um, for us. It, it, it has been um, ever since the park's been designated and, and we have worked really, really hard to improve um, the supply of housing within the park, but we're aware there's an ongoing issue. Um, we, we do want to see more affordable housing in particular within the park, but some of the challenges around that are delivery. Um, we don't have a supply of easy to develop housing sites within the park. Most of the sites are small, they're constrained, and there's, there's real challenges in terms of services um, and infrastructure. So it's really expensive to build within the park. Um, so the job of this plan is to keep raising, um, raising that as an issue and to pull partners together to influence budgets and to influence delivery and to make sure that, that we do have um, budget um, allocation over, over the coming years. What we've raised in this plan is also um, that we need to deal with the, the loss of housing that we're seeing, that there's no point in continuing to build more housing within the park when we're losing more housing from our supply. So we know um, that we have issues within <clears throat> some areas of the park. We're not certain it's across all of the park, but we know in some areas there's issues with increasing numbers of holiday lets and short term lets as well. So we are asking within the plan for people's views on whether we should start to consider some interventions 
um, to start to see how we can retain the housing supply that we have. Okay, thanks very much. And we ought to make a point that obviously we're talking really strategic here. We'll have a local development plan also hard on the heels of this one. And that's where a lot of the detail for some of the housing will get in. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to, to give you the next steps and close us. But I think this, I'm just going to take one more comment, uh, not really a question. And that is that um, uh, it, it's a very good point. It's saying have these resources been shared in areas directly adjacent to the national park? Because clearly we don't exist in a vacuum. Um, we need to be talking to not just the immediate ones, but actually also the folk in Glasgow, the folk elsewhere who come and visit the place. So I think that's a really good point that the, the challenge we have is, is definitely people who want to come in, people who live nearby, people who live in the park and trying to uh, accommodate them all. Um, fantastic set of questions. Please keep them coming in. We will answer them all um, uh, one way or another. And I'm now going to um, hand over to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for sharing that. And thanks everyone for all the points and insights and questions uh, and challenges to us as well. Um, we really, really appreciate them. So I'm going to just take us towards a closing couple of quick points. Um, the recording of this meeting is going to be shared. So we hope that will be a wider uh, resource for people who are unable to be here this evening. Um, if you want to go online, for those of you, I'm presuming everyone here is, is online, so you can go online. So you could go to lockalomond-trossics.org forward slash future. And you can read the plan in full that Simon took you through today at lightning speed and further information. There's a link to the platform um, that we went through called Commonplace, where you can join the conversation. And many of the points, we'll, we, we'll take a, a, a grab of all the comments that are made on the Q&A today, but it'd be really great if you go into Commonplace to take a look uh, at areas of the plan, the different topics uh, and the different areas within the park and add your insight, your challenges or your confirmation that we are actually focusing in the right direction. That's also good for us to um, hear. Um, and on Commonplace, you can sign up for updates uh, about uh, this project and the development of the plan and also find out about, I think, as Jim asked a question and Susan covered, um, where there'll be more events that are about doing a few things offline um, that will happen over June and July. And finally, a bit of a deadline for your diaries. Uh, we are running until the 19th of July, so please do get it in before. Um, just a kind of reminder to close out that this really, this plan, this is our strategic plan, and it is putting out there our commitment to take on these issues. And hopefully you'll see from our answers tonight, and if you uh, do take the time to tune into our quite long board meetings, you'll see that we have a commitment to to challenge, uh, to take on these challenges that we've put in the plan. But we're really keen to understand if we are particularly missing something. Is there something that we've really missed that you think we need to have in that plan? That's really important to us. And we are here doing these kinds of calls and doing this consultation because we do want to keep listening and build on the knowledge that we have to date. Um, and for all of the topics that you see uh, within the plan, as I said, it's a commitment for us to take those on. And there will, of course, be further, not just consultation, but co-production and co-design uh, with uh, different user groups and communities across the National Park within each of these different strands. Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to close it uh, out or actually pass over to Emma, but maybe Emma, since you helped organise us all and get everyone together this evening, you should have the final, final word. So I'll pass back to Emma, hopefully not on the spot today. <laughs> <laughs> a little on the spot, but it's fine. Um, I suppose I just really want to say a really big thank you to everyone that's given up some time on this sunny Monday evening. I think considering the weather, we weren't too sure what the turnout would be, but really uh, pleased to see a, a good number of people uh, that have shown an interest. You're clearly interested in the National Park and we're interested in what you have to say kind of throughout this period. So please, as, as Sarah said, do visit Commonplace, read the plan or read the summaries and let us know uh, your thoughts on it but also how you think we can work together whether that's just to kind of talk with you yourself and your communities over this next six seven weeks or work together to deliver some of the big things um, but just a really big thank you and uh, we'll be sharing the recording and coming back to you after tonight
Thanks very much, everybody. I think that's us very finished. Just to say again, if you have any questions, please send them to National Park Plan at flocklomond.trossics.org. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Bye. Thanks, all.